All right, good afternoon. And um, I think for the sake of time, we'll get started. And today I'm supposed to give you a primer about cardiovascular PET. So we're gonna start with the basic principles and current application, I'll focus primarily on perfusion today because there are more across the time of the year, there are more dedicated lectures to viability and other um, applications of cardiac PET. So I won't touch on them, but I'll focus today on perfusion. Okay, so what's cardiac PET? What does PET stand for? Positron emission tomography. So what's so how is it different from SPECT? So SPECT is the modality that we use all the time and we try to image patients with. And it's the most commonly used modality in the United States to assess patients with uh, for ischemia or for coronary artery disease. So how is it different from the machine-wise? So I'll start with the hardware and then go to radiopharmaceuticals later. So how is the machine different than the SPECT machine? So first of all, for those of you who are on Foundry 9 and you go and see the machine with SPECT, like this is one machine that we have upstairs. So you have the detectors in front and then the CT is on the back. So what type of detectors we use? I know Dr. Mamerian covered that before. I know you're eating, but I don't want you to put to put you to sleep. So I'm going to keep asking questions. So CD, CZT or sodium iodide. So sodium iodide is the detector that we are using here. And we capture the photons that come from the different radiopharmaceuticals we use with SPECT. With PET, sorry, with SPECT, the camera, another difference is that if you go and notice a patient being imaged, the camera is gonna rotate around the patient. So it's the patient is gonna be on a table and then the camera will make an arc around the patient. So these two are just like from an outside view are very different than what we do with PET. With PET, this is how a PET CT machine looks like and this is the machine that we have right now in the research institute which we are doing our cases on. So this is a PET CT, so it has both a PET machine and a CT machine. And our machine actually has a 64 slice system with it, or 128 slice, but covers like a four centimeter. So similar to 64 slice from others. Usually the CT is on the bottom and the front. So they, when you go inside the room, the front part is the CT and the back part is usually the PET. So you have these nice covers from different vendors, how they make the PET CT. But if you look at it, this is from another vendor. So we're showing you how a machine will look differently. It's a longer board. The board is about 80, 70 to 80 centimeter, depends on different patients or different vendors. But once you take this cover, these nice covers, what do you think inside? Last time, Dr. Uh, Sumin showed you how the CT will look like. So this is when we take the cover, this is how a PET CT machine. So when they bring it on site, this is how it come. And now I'm showing you from the front. So you have the XCA tubes and the detectors where this is the front part where you have just like any other CT machine. From the back part, so where the people are doing the installation here. So if we go on the back and look at it, now you see these rings. So here, in comparison to the SPECT where the detector is gonna rotate around the patient, now we have detectors all around the patient. So it's a full circle of detector, we call them rings. So the full circle, the patient is gonna go inside and there are rings of detector running around the patient. And we'll tell you why we need it like this for PET compared to SPECT. So if we zoom on it more, so you here we have four rings. In this system, for example, each ring was about five centimeters. So you have 20 centimeter of coverage for this patient. Our machine has wider coverage, the one that we have here, because the ring detectors are wider. So we have more coverage for the patient. So what is behind these? So each one of these is a unit. And so for example, sometimes if you're doing QC and the machine fails, 
they will tell you that ring number two and detector box number this is failing and you need to go back and replace it. So all the uh, service people will do, they're gonna come, take it out and put a new one in. So how does it look when they take it out? So when they take it out, this is how it is. So it is a unit and the unit has a detector it has a photomultiplier tube, something very similar to what Dr. Mamerian mentioned three weeks ago in his lecture. So, but the detector is very different than what you have in spec. The photomultiplier is very similar concept, and now you have the electronics in the back. And then they are all around the patient. So that's the most expensive part of the machine, it's the detector. And because you have to cover multiple rings around the patient, that's why these machines are much more expensive than a regular spec CT machine. Now, these are the detectors that we are using in PET. So sodium iodide we mentioned is for spec. For PET, you can either have a BGO or the most commonly used nowadays is a lutetium based so LSO. So all you need to know that these detectors are lutetium based. There are factories where they grow them. So for example, our machine, the detectors are usually grown in Tennessee. There's a factory and they have to do a very delicate job, keep it at a regular special temperature. And it will be interesting for those of you who are interested in this at one time to go and visit some of these to, uh, if you are like looking for a machine to see how they grow them. It's a very interesting experience because they have to grow them into different special characteristics and sometimes they got impurities in there that they need to take out and make sure that the detector is pure. So the detector, the most commonly used nowadays from the three common vendors that sell PET scans are LSO. If you have an old system, so if you're buying a refurbished system, you probably could end up having a BGO system. However, these are not available. So if you go to like Siemens, Philips, or GE and tell them I want to buy a BGO system brand new from your factory, they don't have them. So most current systems are LSO. And they actually, the differences between the different uh, detectors vary primarily on how much, what uh, intensity and the wavelength they capture and how much light they give you when a photon hit them. So how these detectors work, so... A, yeah, the intensity of the light that you get out of them. So you get most of it actually more with the LSO and that's why we're getting, all the vendors are moving toward the LSO. I'm not sure on this one. So these are some characteristics, physical characteristics that I'm not sure about this. I think it might be just the um, atomic weight or something. Yeah. So it's just the thickness, right? It could be. Well, when you get You have an expert. Yeah. Okay, so once you get hit by a photon, a gamma ray from the radio pharmaceutical, and we'll go over that, it will generate light. And then it goes into this photomultiplier tube, and then it will get amplified. So this is how a real unit will look like. These are detectors. And then a photon will come, it will hit, and some from one photon, it will be just amplified inside this photomultiplier tube. So one event is gonna become more intense, so then it goes to electronics and try to position it where it's coming from, as we will show later. So this is the different, so it will enhance the signal, yes. So as if like you're getting a beam of light and you put it through the mirror. So it will like make the whole room kind of a dark room, will make it look brighter and then you will have the ability to detect it. Because if you're gonna just detect what you emit from the patient, then you will need much more higher doses and you'll have to capture them much more. So you just go and now detect it. And these are like the old machines. Now, the newer systems, which we have, 
now has this, instead of having a regular tube, a photomultiplier tube, which break more often and give you, give you a more hard time, especially on the SPECT system, now we have a the electronic and digital. So the, detect, the detector, the LSO, is now just attached to electronics itself. So this is how it looks. This is the old PMT system, and now this is the newer one. So it's all chips in there, and now it's all electronics. And now it's electronically amplified, so technically you have higher capability of amplifying it. Now you have lower doses. So that's why these new systems, which have been available now just for the past two years, allow you to even give lower doses to the patient because you're going to be able to amplify it more and get a better image quality despite using lower dose. The other thing that has been kind of for discussion is, shall we use a 2D or 3D system? So Dr. Mamarian also inspect, told to you about all these septa that we put in front of the detectors. So we only capture the detectors, the gamma rays that are coming from the specific point we want it to. Now in PET, this is where we started. We put in a septa. And now we capture just the one that's when it's coming from the heart. However, there are way more photons that are coming from different places that we are discarding. They could be coming from the heart, but they just got tilted a little bit with attenuation, a little bit absorbed, a little bit less energy. So you could not give these, you could not actually be able to capture them and you need so when I was in training, we, were, we had a 2D system. With a 2D system, just to mention these numbers, you need to inject 50 to 60 millicuries of rubidium to the patient to be able to get a decent image quality. And the last week of the generator life, you're not going to be able to, uh, to get a good image quality on obese patients. Now, when we move forward to 3D system, now we don't have septa. So we capture more, but what we are capturing, we're capturing true events, but we're also capturing noise. So we need to have better electronics that will allow us to separate noise from the, uh, from the true events. And this is possible with the electronics that we have with PET, and that's why now all the vendors sell you only 3D systems. So if you go and tell them I want a 2D system, it's not being made. It could be custom made. Now for uh, now with the electronics, data have shown that you are able to achieve whatever you are able to achieve with 2D systems with much lower dose. So when I moved on after fellowship from a 2D system to 3D system, instead of injecting 50 millicuries, 50 to 60, now I move to 30 to 35 millicuries. So you can see the difference between 2D and 3D systems you are able to at lower the dose, and now the electronics have the capability of separating true incidents from randoms. And finally, looking at the machine now, is looking at the attenuation correction. So attenuation correction is a luxury or option on Fundren 9 on SPECT imaging, but it is a must on PET, so you cannot generate PET images without uh, attenuation. You cannot generate accurate PET images without attenuation correction. I'll tell you why, but here, and because I'm focusing on the machine, I'll show you how we do the attenuation correction. So we have the old way, which is a transmission scan. So the patient will be in the PET scan, and there is a radioactive source running around the patient. It's either germanium or cesium and it will be running around the patient creating an attenuation map. And the attenuation map will look like this. So we are able to know where is the lung, where is the soft tissue, and then we are able to draw a mu map and correct for the differences in energy for these patients. However, again, this is all technology. It's almost not utilized anymore, and now we are using the CT. Uh, what we do is that we do a very low dose CT, very low dose. So our machine here, so for those of you who rotated with us, so we are using a, like, and for those who are doing CT, our DLP for the CT is 12. This means this is equivalent to three chest X-rays. 
this is what we do with um, uh, CT attenuation correction. We use very low dose CT, and we all what we want to know is the composition of the of the body where we are imaging the heart. How much soft tissue these photons had to pass through before they make it to the detector? Because these photons, while passing through, they lose some of their energy. Some of them are get uh, delayed because they're passing through air, through bones, through soft tissue. And we, we need to know that so we can take into that into account and amplify that. So it is very uh, helpful now, and most uh, CT is now, most uh, all PET CT, all PET systems right now, they, if you want to buy a new one, it's going to be a PET CT. And obviously now there's some research trying to use MRI on PET MR systems as an attenuation correction. That's still way distant for before be getting to become a routine use. But this is like one of the areas that those who have a PET-MR system are working hard on. Okay, so now, when, and this is how a PET-CT, so technically I generate a low-resolution CT, and you can see here, all I'm using it is to put the image of the heart, so I know that the photon that I got from this wall had to travel all this distance before it make it to the detector, while the one that made it from the back, it traveled a little bit. The one that coming from the RV had less travel if it's moving forward, but way more travel than it's coming backwards. So the two photons are going to be a little bit different in time and energy when they reach the detector, one from the front, one from the back. Any questions so far before we move to pharmaceuticals? Yes. So it will calculate, they call it the mu index. So the question is, what is this map calculating? So it will calculate how much, what is the composition of this tissue? So air has a mu distance that it is known to attenuate photons. And then you have soft tissue, and then you have bone. So it will tell you this photon have passed through this much air, this much soft tissue, this much bone. So a 511 keV photon may reach you at 490 there because it has to pass through all of these. So it will kind of compare, compensate that, while the one that traveled to the back had to pass through much more. Now it's getting you at a much lower energy because it has to travel more to, the, to get to the detector. It's not projecting the location as much as it is trying to compensate for different attenuations. So for example, when you do SPECT imaging, a common example is that photons coming from the inferior wall has to pass through the belly so there is more soft tissue, so it gets less intense when it gets there. Some of it gets absorbed there and don't even make it. So you get an inferior wall defect there. So, but with PET here, with SPECT, you're only passing through one wall because you're imaging only from the front. While in PET, I'm imaging through a detector's ring. So I'm detecting something coming to the front, something coming to the back. So the energy of the same spot photon is not gonna be the same in the front and the back because it's passing through different types of tissue, different milieus, and this, that's why I need to get a correction factor so to know what it passed through to make a calculation of what to expect from there. And John is like, yeah, no, I mean, he it's is. Really, it's really not that complicated because you're looking at different attenuation coefficients in different tissues, and you're adjusting, okay, the, the amplitude or the intensity of the photon based on the attenuation. By the, uh, based on the attenuation coefficient. So, you wouldn't expect any attenuation in air, okay? But in, in fat, you'd get attenuation. In muscle, you get more attenuation. In bone, you get a, a lot of attenuation. And then you, can, then you would uh, adjust the, the, the uh, image based on, based on the attenuation coefficient. This is automated. It's all automated. Yeah, yeah. The other question to you is 3D versus 2D. I mean, that's a major change. Uh, and, and the pros and the cons. So is the accuracy overall better with the 3D? 
So I mean, because most, I can see some challenges. Yeah, exactly. So with elect in the early days, electronics were not as good in terms of gathering all these randoms. But right now, like our system is even higher sensitivity. But despite that, we're detecting way more randoms than we are detecting trues. But still, the system has a luxury of throwing everything that labels as random. And whatever is getting us through, I'm still getting a good image quality because my image, my system has much higher sensitivity. I mean, I mean just, I don't want to belabor this just because there are some false positives and false negatives. The question is validation with the newer system. How, how comfortable are you guys with? Meaning, uh, are we more on so, the sensitivity, more on the specificity? How, how do so you... at least that the same transition happened, the same discussion happened when we transitioned from 2D <laughs> to 3D. So there are some people, even across the street, who still don't believe that a good PET scan, you can do good PET flow with 3D, they're still using the 2D. However, there are many studies that have validated from diagnostic and prognostic value that you get a very accurate data set from 3D with the current electronics. Now, the newer system, I have to tell you, this has been around only two years. We have few data, but we have done some phantom experiments. I have done like one on our system just to make sure that our data is good and we're getting a physicist at the end of the month to help even build on this experiment just to make sure at least what we are getting appears reasonable, but we need to validate these numbers that we're not saturating our crystals and others. Yeah, I mean, some of the issues go back to when we were talking about spectrum. We talked about high sensitivity uh, uh, collimators versus low, right? And so if you have a very, if you have a general purpose collimator, you're going to get a lot of, of potentially scattered photons into it. Even though you're getting more counts, they're going to be not the proper counts, right? So, so whereas if you use a high, if you use a, a high resolution collimator, you get less counts, but you get more spatial resolution. So you can see with 3D, you might have a problem with spatial resolution depending on, you know, the degree to which you're getting scatter and that you're picking up scattered photons. But remember that intrinsically, rubidium, for instance, has intrinsic problems with resolution because it it annihilates from where it originates. We're gonna come to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so this is this all becomes part of the yeah. issue, right? Yeah. So and, we will um, come to that. But uh, the bottom line is, at least for, we are, we have good accuracy overall for the amount of radiation we're giving the patient. The newer system has much less data, and this is type of data we're trying to generate. I would like to just make one other point that there actually is FFR data comparing FFR in the cath lab to to, to uh, rubidium PET, and the correlation is actually incredibly good uh, compared to angiography, where you're looking at just 50% stenosis or whatever. In fact, it's better than SPECT, and it's better than even, C it's better than CTA, because CTA has its own intrinsic yeah. problems with overestimating stenosis. Okay, so any more questions about instrument if I saw? Uh, SPECT could never have a 3D system, right? Because, I mean, we would, one, have no spatial resolution, mostly because with PET, you need two photons to hit to be detected. Whereas with SPECT, with the emission, if it's coming from all over the place, and you, have, you wouldn't be able to resolve your... No, you need a high-resolution column. Uh, otherwise, you, you get all these constant scattered events that you okay. have no idea where they're, where, where they're coming from. But that's why you can do it in PET, because you always have... The other Exactly, because you have to have two photons, and we're going to cover that in the radiopharmacy. Okay, so now we're coming to the PET radiopharmacy. So obviously, to get a PET program going, you need the machine, but you also need the radio tracers. So Isaac, what are the radio tracers we're using in SPECT right now? Technetium. That's our, and which one that Dr. Mamerian does not like? The other one. Valium. <laughs> All right, so these are the two that we are using with SPECT. All right, so now we're going to switch to newer radio tracers, so you're going to hear newer words. So, but just to generate, to compare them, just like in general, as two groups, so SPECT, 
radio tracers come from a generator, while the PET ones either come from a generator or from cyclotron. I will cover more details there. The energy, if you're using thallium, it's 80. If it's using technetium, 140. While with PET, no matter which one you use, you have 511. So the energy is not gonna be attenuated easily. It's gonna move even through obese patients. The resolution is better, and this is something that Dr. Mamiya spent a long time discussing last time. Uh, attenuation is less because of the energy. The half-life is now, even though I'm using higher energy, my half-life is either 75 seconds to almost 13 minutes. Now, this is for perfusion agent for FTG is going to be two hours. But the, for the current approved agents, we're talking about very much lower. While for technetium, it's six hours. For thallium, it's 72 hours. So as if, like, think of it, either you put, like, something on the oven and you put it at a very high temperature for a short time, or you're putting it on a low temperature, but now you're putting it for longer time. The exposure is going to be much more if you are putting it on a uh, longer time but lower energy. Now radiation is much less and the study duration is much shorter. However, currently we are using pharmacologic almost exclusive. There have been some research studies looking at ammonia with exercise, but with pharmacolo with SPECT we are using more, you can do both technically or in at least you can encourage your patients to exercise. So what is an ideal PET tracer? Ideally, what I would like to have is a tracer that come to me as a unit dose. So if I have one patient, I can do one. If I have 10 patients, I can order 10 doses. I want something that goes more into the myocardium, so higher extraction. So I don't want it to go to other, more to other parts of the body as much as it's being picked up more in the myocardium in a linear relation as we will see. Would like it to be in a lower positron range, which I'll show you in a second. Would like to have the ability to do an exercise imaging and then the ability to quantify blood flow. Unfortunately, this tracer is not available, but I'll show you the tracers that we have which has different characteristics. I'll show you this in later slides, but the three, the two tracers that are FDA approved are Rubidium-82 and N13 ammonia. O15 water is not approved in the US, but if you're reading the literature, you'll see a couple sites in Europe produce, uh, use it. And FDG or F18, it's FDG is approved for metabolism, but there is a new F18 perfusion agent which is currently being studied and will touch base on it. So the first one is the extraction and Dr. Mamerian showed this in his lecture, but now we're adding the PET agents on the top. So O15 water is linear. Our body is made mostly of water. So when you inject radioactive water, it will just freely diffuse through the myocardium. So that's why you're not going to be able to generate a nice image. So what you can measure is flow. So technically, if you have a lesion which is causing even drop in flow from 4 to 3, theoretically, you can detect a change in myocardial blood flow with O15 water, but you may not be able to detect it with SPECT or other PET agents. Now, N13 ammonia is better than rubidium. And rubidium is closer actually to the technetium agents. But when we go, so how do these work? So we inject the radio tracer in the patient at rest, it will get to the myocardium. Now there is energy, that positron, let's say it's passing here, that positron is gonna just move a distance before it annihilates. So it has high energy, it will just move too much. If it is low energy, it's gonna move a little bit. And then the positron is at this point, it's, it's originated from this point, so technically we should position it at this point. But it moved here and now it annihilates and gave two gamma rays at 511 keV. Now this one is gonna go to the upper detector and this one is gonna go to the lower detector. That's why we need a ring and not the one. And we time them by what we call how much time. So ideally, if they annihilate from the same, from within that detector, they should reach within certain 
time. And this is what we call the time of flight. So we want them to arrive within almost few seconds, a picosecond, not second, picosecond, not even millisecond. So if they arrive longer than that time, we're gonna call them randoms and throw, the, throw these photons away. And now this distance that, from this distance to here, because when I go and reconstruct my image, I'm gonna reconstruct it as if this positron was here. But technically the positron was here, not here. And this is what we call a positron range. So they've done some phantom studies and try to understand how much of a problem is this. So you go ahead, bring a tube, put some radioactive material in it and image it. And these are the positron range of different agents. So for O15 water, you can see it, it has a positron range of four millimeter. So technically it moved four millimeter before it annihilated. Ammonia was better, 2.53. Rubidium was 8.6, so it's much more. And then fluperidas or F18 is 1.03. So F18 would be the best in terms of that. Now, how does that impact on image quality? So I'll show you the first one is the patient we did a few weeks ago. And this is on top, you see rubidium. So you can see here, you cannot tell the full details. You can see the RV. But you can see that the images, I mean, these are zoomed in images, but you can see, you cannot tell the details of the myocardium. But here, this is an F18 agent. And you can even see the details of the myocardium. You can even see the papillary muscles in there. So you can see the difference between this 8.6 and 1.03 is very different. It appears, it results in difference in appearance. Now, does that impact on diagnostic accuracy? At least so far, there's not strong data to say that ammonia PET at least is different. Now, here's another example of a patient that uh, this slide is given to me by Dr. Durbala, and she had a patient who had both rubidium and ammonia imaging on clinical systems. And you can see this is the rubidium images. These are the ammonia images. But then when I zoom on it, these are the rubidium images. They look very similar to what I just showed you. And these are the ammonia images. Yes, technically ammonia is a little bit like more sharper, but then you have to remember when you are reading ammonia, there is this inferolateral defect, which is most often an artifact rather than an ischemia. And this is, so that's another problem with some detective, some radioisotopes that we don't know what is causing it. And you, when you read it, you have to be very careful about it. Now, so finally, I'm just going to touch one thing before I go into the different isotopes. So we talk about events. So when an event, two photons hot hit the two detectors who are, that are 180 degrees at the same time, within picosecond, we'll call them true event. So... Because it's gonna, one of them is going to travel a little bit more than the other one, it depends on how long it's traveling, we allow some time difference in picosecond. However, it may happen that two, two photons hit the two parallel or two horizontal detectors at the same time, and they may not be coming from the same place. So, for example, here, this is a photon, Okay, one of them came here, and then the second one was supposed to go here, but then suddenly it got attenuated and scattered, and now it went and hit this one. So I will think that it is coming from here, but in reality it's coming from here. It just so happened. And this could be a problem. Now, it may not happen within that time limit, so the more stringent you are on your time limit, then you will be able to detect this. And then finally, there could be just two separate events. One of them is coming from here, and the second one is coming from here. And now they hit two horizontal, and then we will place one at the same time. So there are some potential for some of the differences and uptake that you will get. And you rely on your electronics to be able to separate them, but obviously the separation may not be 100%. As long as you are able to separate most of the randoms from the truths, most of the time your image is good. 
Now, a digital system, you can go and when we inject rubidium in our patients, you'll see we capture almost that the randoms are double the truth. So technically, we're getting way more detection of events because we are very sensitive and we are, we are a 3D system. So you're combining both, and now I'm getting way more bombarded with uh, effects. Now, once I get to a lower energy state, so most of my rubidium has decayed, now I'm getting more truths and then less rubidium. So this is primarily when you are using high energy uh, radio pharmaceuticals like rubidium and other agents in uh, perfusion. So quickly, we're gonna drill through the radio pharmaceuticals. What are they? So we have I O15 water, a uh, common board question. They will always ask you, what's the ideal flow tracer? It's O15 water, because it will just like flow freely in there. And the first pass extraction is almost unity. So the more flow you have, the more you detect it. So you can detect number by flow. However, you cannot create an image with O15 water and you can primarily measure flow. So it is like for, for the fellows with us on PET, you can only get CFR. So if the CFR is low because of diabetes, you cannot tell because you're only measuring flow in there. And now it's gold standard to compare to other radio tracers for flow, so in research. The half-life is almost 120 seconds, so it gives you a low count rate and it kind of freely diffuses quickly from the myocardium. And it needs a cyclotron. So technically you can produce it, but it needs a cyclotron, which has to be very sh close by. So technically you get the patient, you inject the gadenostan, get the dose, immediately inject it to the patient to get ready to uh, going for that. Now N13 ammonia is also cyclotron produced. The half-life is 9.8 minutes. So we give about 20 to 40 millicuries with, per injection. So 20 if you have a 3D system, 40 if you have a, a 2D system. And because of the longer half-life, it allows you to exercise the patient. However, the exercise treadmill has to be inside so close by to the treadmill because the moment they're done, you're gonna put them on the treadmill and the patient will be heavily breathing. So you could potentially get some upward creep like they used to get in the thallium days. Now, it need, that's the other issue with, uh, th with ammonia. Because of the half-life, you do rest, but then you need to wait for the rest dose to decay, and then you inject stress. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to give the three fudge factor like we do in spec. So that's why we have to go ahead and wait for 50 minutes. So technically, you put the patient on the table, then remove the patient from the table, and then put them back in the table. So it is technically uh, not that much favorable for high volume labs. So if you have too many patients, you might keep putting patient. Every 10 minutes, you have to put a patient on the table, move, put, move, put, move. And you have to have enough rooms where the radio label, uh, radio pharmaceutical is uh, decaying. While with rubidium, by the time you're done with your image acquisition, all the radioactivity has delayed. So it is better for labs that are doing high volume. Um, the second thing about ammonia, it requires a cyclotron. So technically, if we are like, let's say cyclotron is in the RI and our PET scanner in the OPC. So if I want 10 millicuries in the, or 20 millicuries in the OPC, they need to give me 100 from here. And somebody has to carry them all the way to the OPC, get the elevator, go up, by the time they get there, half of it is gone. By the time I calibrate and inject the patient, probably another 10 minutes, half of it is gone. And you have to repeat it the same thing for stress. So stress, 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 stress. So you can see, unless your cyclotron is, unless you do the cyclotron next by, next door, it might be a little bit challenging. And that's why some companies have tried to say, okay, well, you may not need a whole big, huge cyclotron to just produce ammonia. Why can't we make a quote-unquote mini cyclotron? And this is now FDA approved, so you can go and buy it. There is one site that I'm aware of are using it. It's called a company called Antex. It will give you only ammonia, probably smaller than this. You can put it like it have a quick... So it needs like a small room next to your PET scanner, and then you can just go milk it, get the... Uh, 
uh, ammonia injected the patient. So it is kind of a mini cyclotron that you can get ammonia from. So among sites who would like really to do ammonia. Now rubidium, it comes from a parent molecule called strontium. It has a half-life of 75 seconds. So technically after five half-lives, it's gone. So you make the math and you can know that up at 10 minutes, there is nothing left in there. So these are the doses. If you are using a, uh, if you are using a 2D system, you have to do 40 to 60, 25 to 30 for a 3D system. And we've imaged some patients on our digital one with even 10 millicuries, and we have beautiful images despite that. And the injection rate is over 30 seconds. The nice thing is that the whole study is done in 20 minutes. Uh, it's now available from two companies. So there are these are the two generators. So these are the injection system, and in small here you see the uh, generator. So every 42 days or six weeks you get a one from the company. So you don't need to change the whole injection system. All you need to change is this generator, and now you're good to go for another 40 day, 42 days. Now there is a new agent that's going to be tested. Now it's not FDA approved yet, but we hope that it will be helpful. It's now in phase three trial, and hopefully we'll start enrolling here in about one week or two, Mohammed, for the Fluperidas trial, it's pending one final thing. And hopefully once we get that, so it is an F18 agent, so the uptake is better than the others. However, the half-life is 120 minute. So now you're injecting it, but the patient overall is going to require some time in between the two studies. Otherwise, you have to do one dose like we do same-day protocols, one dose and then triple the dose for the second one. Uh, so the way this is Fluperidas, these are some images from the literature. So this is the same patient had a SPECT. And this is how, compared to fluperidas PET, you don't even see the defect. And there is a clear anterior defect that you see here, which you don't even appreciate there. Well, and this is another patient that actually has poor image quality. You see this inferior wall defect, attenuation. So not very different than what we see on some of our patients. You can see the image quality on the fluperidas imaging. And the fluperidase will be very similar to the F18 that I showed you on the comparison with rubidium. So we're still waiting to see how long does it take to come, but it is probably at least two to three years before it make it to reality once the results are final, and if the results are positive, and then FDA clearance for that. So there's still, so we are not gonna clinically use it, but you will have some research exposure to it once we do some patients from the uh, study. And the study is comparing it to SPECT, so you'll see uh, SPECT images, you'll see fluperidase images, and all patients are gonna make it to the cat lab and have an angiogram to determine if they have obstructive disease or not. Is this exercise? So you can do it with both. Exercise. You can do exercise or pharmacologic. Just maybe this is a good time to tell the fellows and the attendings if we have any. We'll, we'll tell okay. you more about so it. But we'll if you have any. We'll tell you more once we're initiated. We're not initiated yet. But once we get initiated, we are looking for patients that you want to enroll, that you want to refer to the cat, cat lab mm -hmm. for a clinical indication. Be it a positive CT, positive calcium score, Dr. Nasir, uh, positive uh, treadmill stress test, but you already made a clinical decision that this patient is going to go to the cath lab. You, as long as the cath lab is not needed immediately and the patient can wait for a week, we would like to stress them twice. One with SPECT and one with fluperidas. So if they already stress with SPECT, if there is indication for CAT is SPECT stress, we're not going to repeat the stress. But the point here is that we need to get fluperidase from the company and it's going to be flown to us from Tennessee. So we need to make arrangements for it to come. We'll bring the patient to the RI, we'll stress them, get the fluperidase image, and then they can go for the CAT. So if you have a patient that you are referring electively for CAT, 
and on any other indication. It can be whatever, it's either symptoms or you have a positive stress test, positive CT, positive calcium, positive rubidium PET, whatever you have an indication, would like to have, at least for the patient, SPECT and PET, or if they have a SPECT, we'll not repeat it, and then we'll take the CATH information. So there have been some attempts to do, and the protocol we will image the patients on will potentially allow us to get CFR. But again, this is, uh, it requires some validation there. So the prior trial, the data was analyzed, and they could measure some CFR in there. It was just presented like a few weeks ago. Is that uh, we would prefer that the reason why the patient isn't enrolled is because of a positive spec study, <laughs> because that would that causes a tremendous amount of in, intrinsic bias. So we would prefer to have people because of abnormal calcium scores or abnormal CTs or whatever that you want to take them to the cath lab, not because of an abnormal perfusion scan. So the readers, we're not reading them locally. They're going to go blinded reads. So they'll put, bring Dr. Mamerian, put a computer, and he's going to go over 500 studies. <laughs> or oh, not Dr. Mamerian. <laughs> so they are like blinded reads, and uh, people have to do this like without, comp so there's a core lab for SPECT, core lab for SPET, core lab for uh, angiography interpretation. Any question about radiopharmaceuticals? So this is just like a summary of what I just mentioned, the different radioisotopes. Now here I have F18, so not this does not cover fluperidase, but primarily the half-lives, you need to remember that uh, rubidium is 76 seconds, so technically by the time the patient leaves the PET unit, PET room, the patient has no residual radioactivity. Ammonia takes about an hour for all the residual activity, radioactivity to go. If we're using fluperidase, that will take about a 10 hours because it's usually, we call it five half-lives. Half-life is two hours, so 10 hours for the patient to become not radioactive. And then the positron range, it varies, it depends on what you are looking for, whether it's in air or in water. Here I'm showing you an air data. And now the image quality is very good, but much better with ammonia and uh, F18 agents. Uh, data for flow is similar, at least in terms of diagnostic and prognostic. And finally, for FDA approval, the only two that are FDA approved right now are rubidium and N13. Any question? So I'll just show you a few slides about how we do the study. So Carlos, Shadden, Basil, and Drusha have seen this live. And for general fellows, if you're interested and you're on the nuclear, at least you should attempt to see one or two studies there. So it's a very simple, and the text you have, they just left, but they can walk you through. It's a very simple procedure. So what we are doing is we're trying to localize the heart. We try to get the, what we call transmission scan which is trying to get the CT attenuation correction, and then finally we get our imaging. So how we do it? So we'll just walk you through. And this is a typical protocol for the Gadenoson. So we start with the scout, takes about one second, two seconds. Then we do CT attenuation correction, and we cover this much. Our DLP is very short, very small. Then we go ahead and inject our rubidium, and this is for the slide I didn't upload for the current scanner, but most other people are using 3D scanners, so people are injecting 25 to 35 millicurie. Here we're injecting 10, 10 to 20, depends on the patient body habitus. We acquire a list mode imaging. List mode means that we gather, we don't make it static or gated, or uh, so we prepare a row data, and then later on we take it and process it, one for gated to give you ejection fraction, one for flow to give you myocardial blood flow. So with that we acquire it for seven minutes, then while the patient is in the scanner, we go ahead and then give rigadenison over 10 seconds, wait another minute, so at one minute and 10 seconds we will go ahead and inject our rubidium. 
And then we image for another seven seconds. We got another CT attenuation correction. Sometimes we do calcium score at the end. Here we're doing it more at the beginning. So it depends how you do it. And we do it only if the patient does not have known CAD. So obvious patient have stent or bypass surgery, we don't do it. And then the patient is done. The patient goes home. He has no residual radioactivity, 20 minutes on the table, 25 minutes. So now we are able to achieve like table time is about like almost 30 minutes. So it's very quick compared to what you have been going through like uh, on SPECT imaging. But cost is much higher obviously for this one. Now if you are doing adenosine, which we are not doing, but if you end up practicing in a place that you are using adenosine or you want to do dubutamine, it's a very similar protocol. The only thing is, because we inject our rubidium very quickly, you technically need to have two IVs because you don't want to have some residual adenosine and then you flush the rubidium with it, you'll induce AV block. Or if the patient has dubutamine flowing and you inject rubidium in the same IV and now the heart rate is gonna go to the roofs, and the patient might have atrial fibrillation. So it's very important that you have two IVs for these patients. Now for ammonia, it's very similar. The only thing that's different here is that you have to wait 30 to 50 minutes in between the two injections. So technically, if you're using ammonia, there has to be a gap between this and this of about 30 to 50 minutes. So with that, most of the time, you don't want to keep the patient on the PET table, and people move them out, then put them in. So that's why you have to require some coordination and have enough rooms for to allow for that. And once we get our data, we go ahead and now bin it. So we get the list mode data, and what we do is go ahead and put it in bins. So as if I got all the data now, I have the EKG data acquired, I have all the PET data acquired. Now I will say whatever happened in the first 10% of the RR interval, put it in one group. Then the second RR, the second 10% will go into another bin. So this is what we mean by binning. We put it, the data in each one of them is gonna go into one of these as if bags, and now you create an image. So this image, for example, is done into 16 frames. So technically all the data that I got, I put it in 16 frames and now I play them as a movie. So if I play this, now you see, now based on the EKG, I synchronize it. Now not all the photons that I'm image showing you here come from the first beat. Some of them come from the first beat, some come from the uh, later on in the acquisition, but they are all been, they all happening in the same time of the RR interval. In contrast, when I want to do flow, can I quickly skip through this? I'll show you the flow and we'll stop there. So when I want to do the flow, now I want to time. I don't care about the EKG. Now I don't want systole diastole. I want to happen what is happening in the first moment that I'm injecting and what's happening in the second moment. So if I run this, so in the beginning, so forget about the EKG. Most of my counts are in the right ventricle. So you see them here. Now if I move forward, now it's in the LV. Now if I move more forward, now it's in the start to come to the myocardium. So now you see it in the myocardium. So with this, this allows me to make mathematical modeling and come up with how much blood made it into the ventricle, of which, how much of it made it to the myocardium. And there are different math complex mathematical models that will fit this data and will give you the myocardial blood flow. So technically, this is how we summarize it. So you have primarily the gated and the dynamic data. The dynamic data is based on time. The gated data is more based on EKG. All right? And now you can potentially come up and draw these curves. How much is it in the RV? How much is the LV? How much in the myocardium? And the software will allow you to calculate how much is blood flow. You can do it for the entire left ventricle. You can do it for the uh, specific segment 
or you can do it for an arterial territory. So we'll say it's in the LED, RCA, or LCX. All right, with this, I'm going to stop and we'll cover the rest hopefully in other lectures. Thank you. Any questions? Question related to, to coronary flow, the blood flow that you just showed us. How does, uh, are you going to use attenuation correction to take a look at that? Yes. And I, mean, I understand, obviously, that this is probably the most robust way to look at actual flow to the myocardium. Question in your hand, how robust is it? So... I have to say that this is one of the challenges in PET, and that's why in the city probably you have about 10 programs, or in the country there are like almost 250 PET programs. Many of them are not reporting cardiac blood flow because it does require some robustness in doing it rather than more interpretation. That's another dimension. But in doing it, you have to do it very accurately. And that's why we have been doing some experiments, try to test the system and how much you use. So one of the main things is that you don't want to oversaturate your crystals, so you don't want to inject more. So I could inject 40, but then my numbers may not be accurate. So, but the nice thing about it is that the myocardial blood flow, it has been validated with microspheres. I mean, Dr. Gould has done like a career all many years, he started this many years before even on animals and then on this. And it is, if it is done correctly, it does correlate very well. However, the interpretation, people think that, okay, if I have ischemia, I should have like decreased blood flow. It is way more complex. The relation between CFR and FFR and all other hemodynamics. So you could have someone with completely normal perfusion but they have decreased myocardial blood flow because of endothelial dysfunction. Or they could have ischemia, but it is, did not plummet significantly, and these patients may not have a significant decrease in their CFR. So technically, it, is, it adds more import, uh, information, but sometimes could add confusion, especially on more on the interpretation side. I just wonder whether with so many changes in the methodology, technology, so many other things, the 3D, the attenuation correction, and all this, whether it's really worthwhile and maybe important to do some large animal validations. You see, I'm like a, a, you know, dogs or some, some animal validation to take a look, because you're looking at myocardial blood flow, Yes, you could look at, you know, FFR, but FFR is, is not flow, right? It's reserve. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I, at least so, to, to give some confidence to, to the whole field with all so many changes, to say that, you know, we're still in line. Now, some of the interesting things about that, I mean, O15 water actually has been quite well validated. And that was, that was the gold standard, right, in terms of, and, and you're absolutely right, because one of the situations or one of the, complexities of rubidium is it actually its, its extraction fraction because that can also affect your ability to really identify accurate flows at, at accurate accuracy of flow at high rates. But, but there are validation studies between O15 and rubidium. And although they're not absolutely the same, they're fairly comparable. Yeah. No, no, I agree. I think on the digital system, there is not such a... But when this came, like when I was in fellowship, so we were actually validating rubidium against ammonia. So patient will come to Brigham, get a rubidium study, then they go to MGH, get healthy volunteers, and then they get a uh, ammonia study. So, yeah, that was like, this is where most of the data started with rubidium. Then uh, you went ahead and did it. But now the 3D system, this digital one, I fully agree with you that we don't have that much data in terms of comparing it with animal models for perfusion, or at least microspheres or to the other 2D systems. 